So when we're trying to calm people down, you know, we don't want them in a beta state. We want them in an alpha state. Theta is a kind of an interesting one because when I was doing extensive research into work in the Soviet Union that had to do with their research in brain waves, the Soviets discovered that theta had a very strong correlation with ESP phenomena. So it's a little of a of a strange area there, and it has to do with um, high emotional states and also with some somewhat metaphysical things like uh, ESP and PK and so on. And that's a whole other discussion in itself. The final one, Delta, has to do with extreme relaxation and deep sleep. Now, the importance of these things, again, from a mind war, you know, I was talking about these things as one of the psychons that we use in mind war. All of these frequencies take place at the sub-audio level, meaning that when these uh, frequencies are being projected or broadcast, you could be in a room full of alpha, for example, and you wouldn't hear a thing. Or you could be in a room full of beta and not hear a thing. These things are all below your auditory level. But, and this is the important point, the human brain resonates with these brain waves if they reach it externally, which they can not just through your ears, but through your skin, through your skull, uh, any, any medium, really. So if you have a bunch of grouchy people, to simplify this, and put them together in a room, and you want them to start cooperating and agreeing on something, first thing you do is switch on a, an electromagnetic generator and dial it to alpha and blanket the room with alpha. And without any of them really being aware of what's happened, they'll start relaxing and turning into a more positive frame of mind. That's just one of the uh, examples. We could go into that with, with, for example, the area of color. Now, we tend to think of color as um, something that we, well, you like this color. You like red or you like blue or green, and that's my favorite color. And we also think of it socially, that different nations, for example, in the West, we think of black as being sort of a, a funerary kind of color. And white in uh, China would be a funerary kind of color there and so on. Well, how many colors do you think you actually see? You only see three of them. <laughs> Human beings are what are called trichromats. We have sensors in our eyes for red, blue, and green. And everything else that you think uh, that you see is actually your brain combining different sensations of red, blue, and green to come up with all these other subtle colors that you think you know all, that you see all the time. And as, as a matter of fact, there is a, a, a sort of a funny story here because in 1954, there was a film adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds made, and the Martians in that movie had large eyes which were red, green, and blue. That happens to be something that looked good on a monster, but it also happens to be the way your own eyes function. And if you were to disassemble your television set today, or in the days when they still operated with projector guns in back, you would find three projectors back there, red, green, and blue. That's for that same reason. You know, one thing I, I obviously in printers, color, the, every color can be made off three colors alone, and that being red, yellow, and I don't know what the other one is. Is it blue? Oh, red, that that green, and blue. makes sense. Yeah, that would make exactly perfect sense. Um, anyhow. But here's let, the interesting thing, Dr. J, which is that the research that we have done in PSYOP into these colors have led us to the very interesting discovery that the colors by themselves will trigger a different reaction in a human being, which means that if you are exposed to red uh, radiation, and again, we're talking about the electromagnetic spectrum here, so it's not just that you're looking at something red and that you have a visual response to it, we're talking about the actual radiation the wavelengths of this color from the EMS itself that are coming into your brain. The red wavelengths incline you towards anger, and again, it's not, it's not because red is bloody or, or anything like this. It just had a, red makes you angry, blue makes you 
intelligent calm, right? and thoughtful, and green is relaxation. So once again, if you have a room full of people and you've already blanking, you're already blanketing it with alpha radiation, you also want to dial up the blue. <laughs> so what you see here is that as you're, as you're turning these electromagnetic and electrochemical cyclones and bringing them into play, and there are about 12 or 13 of them that I go into in the book, what you're doing is to address the mental state of mind of everybody who's subjected to these. And what you're trying to do is to get them to stop being angry and stop being combative and become as intelligent as they can and as cooperative as they can. And what's also funny about this, you're not just doing this to what you thought were the bad guys. You're doing it to your people, too. Most of these things are very omnidirectional, and most of them cannot be stopped because this kind of electromagnetic radiation is very, very penetrating. And very powerful. Uh, it's, it's interesting, Dr. Aquino, um, you, you know, you're talking about the color vibrations and how they sort of affect us in different resonance of, of like waveform in a sense. You know, it's like the, 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 David Icke used to say, the wave of love is like a long, low flow where, say, mm-hmm. the, the wave of fear becomes very spiky and, and, and it sort of has that different resonant effect on us. And like you say, it's not on the physical level, it's down in the, the, the subconscious sort of uh, higher, higher consciousness sort of realm, you know? We are, be- we are literally at the point now where scientific investigation is breaking these things down into um, actual parts of the electromagnetic spectrum and seeing what happens when you dose a human being, so to speak, so to speak, with these areas of electromagnet- electromagnetic influence. Magnetism is another one of those interesting ones. Magnetic frequency, or fMRI, is now a very interesting area of research. They've been doing it at Yale and some other universities out here, and probably several over in uh, uh, Britain as well. And Stanford, too, you said, sure. right? And magnetism, which you normally don't think that you're subject to magnetism. You know, you're not, your body isn't built of iron or steel or anything, and you don't stick to anything when you <laughs> touch a magnet. But you actually have uh, a sensitivity to certain kinds of magnetism. We do have some magnetic uh, materials in your body that are very fine and very delicate. These are... Uh, a, you might say a sort of a human counterpart to what some birds have when they're using magnetic fields to navigate and so on. Dr. Kino, um, I think that was extremely fascinating, all the research you've done on, on colors. I didn't know the, the effect to that extent. I knew some of it. I think it's very important. Now, how does magnetism uh, take play a role in, in our subconscious, our, our programming, subliminal messaging, and, and most importantly, in what what's the whole topic of mind war? Well, uh, bear in mind, of course, that we're talking again of the about the human body as an electromagnetic machine. And uh, if you look at a an electrical wave and in uh, in the electromagnetic spectrum, it's you might say that it's going up and down, and what's going right and left is the magnetic wave. So for every electrical wave, there's a magnetic counterpart. And this all, uh, to not to go too far afield here, but these are the sorts of things that were getting Albert Einstein fascinated when he was trying to come up with his unified field theory, when he was trying to take all of electromagnetism and figure out that this was sort of the machinery of the entire universe and that somewhere in here you could find things like gravity. But in any case, uh, when you look at magnetism, you're looking at, uh, again, a form of radiation that is different from electrical radiation, but it's still a wave phenomenon that way. And we, of course, are surrounded by it all the time. We live in a sea of this stuff, you know. Uh, we have it every everywhere we go today. We're in a very electronic society. And magnetic waves and magnetic fields, of course, are much um, more pervasive and much harder to stop in some ways than just simple electrical uh, broadcasts. So we, of course, are sitting on a big magnet here called the Earth, you know, which has a huge magnetic field to it. 
there are solar magnetic flares and so on that go on, and there's an entire interesting field of research that takes all of this discussion about climate control and relates it to uh, switching magnetic fields that are in a common constant state of flux. But bringing this down again to mind war, uh, in about 2010, uh, as I discovered, um, MIT neuroscientists discovered that application of magnetic fields to the right temporal lobe of the brain by means of non-invasive uh, technique called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, can temporarily disrupt an individual's ability to make judgments based on previously learned morality. This is really quite something, because we tend to make judgments, and again, this is that pattern thinking thing. We have a moral overlay on whether we think something is good or bad from what we've learned. This is the moral um, decision-making process by which we judge goodness or badness in things. So you can see how important this is. Entire religions are built on the ability to proclaim what is good and bad. So if you can take an electromagnet and stick it next to somebody's head and switch it on, and suddenly you sort of poof this out of his decision-making process, you're going to have a human being who is faced with making decisions without there being any moral qualities of them, whatever. Now, this would be very good if you're dealing with very antagonistic moralities, like, for example, you see now with, ex with uh, the extremism in things like Islam, where you don't want these intense moralities to govern people's decision-making. But you can also see how dangerous something like this, because... Morality is also the basis for our kind of underlying humanitarianism towards one another. Uh, we may have all kinds of, of hard and fast re reasons to want to exploit other human beings or do things with them or to them, but it's our morality that sort of holds this in check and says, well, you can or can't do this because it's not nice and it's not human and it's not compassionate and it's not moral. So what we have got here is a very double-edged kind of sword in this new magnetic technology. Um, this field, generally, if you want to look for it, if your listeners want to look for it, look up functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, because this is the area in which you can not only, as I said, influence human morality, but believe it or not, and this is sort of really at the, at the extreme edge of science these days, through fMRI, you can actually develop pictures so precise of a human brain's processing that you can create visual images of what that person is seeing or imagining. This is mind reading, guys. This is the kind of thing that used to only be there in science fiction stories and people, you know, telling stories about um, what you were referring to earlier, you know, about remote distance viewing and so on. This isn't operating over distances, but we have never before come to the point where we can actually touch somebody's head with, sens with sensors and read the person's thoughts and see what they are seeing. That's what fMRI is taking us to. And again, it's a very fascinating field, um, but also, as you can probably imagine, a very, a very precarious, a very dangerous one, because once you start to be able to read somebody's thoughts, then you're really invading their personal privacy and what they try to consume. Imagine if you're a, an intelligence interrogator and you were to use an advanced fMRI device on somebody that you're interrogating. It doesn't matter whether they're trying to lie to you or not. So you can go right into their head and see what they're thinking, so to speak. One thing I want to comment about that I think is really fascinating is, is I don't want to go too far off point, but once you get to that point of actually being able to read someone's mind, everybody has a facade about themselves. Everybody puts on a, a front, you know, if they're happy or they're sad inside, they'll, they'll go out to be uh, put on a happy face and so on and et cetera, et cetera. The point being is once you dive into that person's mind, 
like you said, you are truly invading their privacy. Uh, and and it, but again, in some ways, this will be good, like you said, for an intelligence uh, interrogator. But on the general public, essentially, and no one's going to be happy. Um, but I just wanted to throw that in there because I think that is if we are definitely moving in a state of getting to technologies to get into the minds and control uh, humans in such ways that have never been dreamed of possible before and and that's why i think the era that we are in now implementing mind war is is so important because it's actually it's actually doable and that's why i think it was so important to have you on the show mm-hmm. well uh, the fields here keep going on. Uh, you can talk, for example, um, another one that your readers may have had some casual familiarity with uh, is the field of proxemics, which has to do with the nearness of other people or the nearness of objects to one another and the tensions or relaxations that that causes. You may be familiar with the oriental science of feng shui, which has to do with the design of rooms uh, to make them more compatible, the flowing of energy. Hmm? It's like it's like the flowing of energy for rooms. You know, the, the feng shui sure. it's aligning. You've got you've got not only the sort of psychological, if you will, impact of this, but you have um, again actual electromagnetic ra- electromagnetic radiation caused by. Um, the distances of objects and the kinds of objects which impact your brain and your thinking processes. So again, so we get bring, that in this the cities. To, bring this down to mind war, if you're having a conference and you're getting everybody together in a room and you've already got it sort of color designed and you've got it brainwave designed, well, the way that you structure the room and the way that you position the furniture in it is also going to, believe it or not, influence people's mental states yes and that's exactly why if you take it advantage of everything like you said colors uh, magnetism uh, feng, sh- feng shui or the way you pronounced it which is the properly proper way i've just always heard it as the wrong way uh, i think this is all fascinating because the combination of everything can send a message to someone subliminally without them thinking that they consciously came to such a conclusion and hence we can get them to relax and get their argumentative states away uh, thinking otherwise and like you said essentially control a population in a positive manner another one uh, that again people will probably be somewhat familiar with uh, but he's also one of the psychons because here we're using it in an actively controlled situation is atmospheric ionization. People are probably aware that a negative ionized atmosphere is relaxing and makes you feel good, and a positive one makes you grouchy and irritable. And again, what we're trying to do with a mind war solution to things is get rid of all the grouchiness and the brittleness. I began, I ran into this again during my PSYOP research when I was checking into, of all things, um, doing a study on office buildings in which people tended to either get along well or not get along well. Uh, you had co-workers who were picking fights with one another or environments that were generally very cooperative where people like to be. And one of the things that I measured was the ionization of the air, uh, often through the air conditioning systems. And what I found, of course, was that if you had a highly negative ioned atmosphere, then people tended to be relaxed and happy, and if you had a positive one, uh, they tended to be little and grouchy. And sometimes it was as simple as tracing this to an old air conditioning duct with a lot of sharp corners that, as the air molecules went through them, tended to break them up and make them positively ionized. So when I was talking to some of these uh, companies that I was doing at the time, I, I, what would you suggest? I'd say, well, for a start, put in some new air conditioning ducts that don't have all those sharp corners. And while you're at it, you know that uh, compressor up on the roof? I measured that sucker, and, you know, it's sending out beta um, vibrations because of the way that it's uh, locked to the roof there. So if you'll insulate it, then you'll get rid of those. 
and you won't have those two irritants to work with. Do, do you think and, that they design those for prisons and things like that, you know, to, to lower that energy? Well, um, you, you, I'm sorry, what was the question? Well, the way you described it was, was that obviously that you change the ambient energy through the negative particles and, and, and ions. Oh, yes, yes. And sure. so the one in, in prisons, do you think that they would use that system there or possibly? Well, I suppose they could. I don't think anybody that I'm aware of is doing that kind of thing right now. I mean, the, the most that... The most that you sort of normally or casually hear about this is in situations like hospitals where they have rooms painted in certain peaceful colors and they sort of reduce sound levels so that patients aren't too agitated. But for the most part, these psychons that I'm referring to in Mind War are completely uh, alien to the way that most people uh, do, do their activities or work at trying to convince or control other people. This is basically a new book that's breaking ground here. The big danger of it, as I said uh, in the book itself, is that what I'm doing really here is opening a kind of a Pandora's box of technologies that most people are simply not aware of, either individually or altogether, and that if this is done for good reasons to reduce human suffering, it can be a, um, a wonderful thing, but you could also have somebody who could misuse this stuff and create a situation very much like the um, thought control of 1984, and that's the bad part. So I am taking a big jump on the side of Plato, who felt that human beings naturally and innately have a tendency to do the good and to be the good. We want to be good people and good guys. We don't want to be bad people and bad guys. And if we're given half a chance, particularly with all these devices surrounding us, then I think that we will incline as a species and as a race to do the good. That's the bet of this book. I sure hope I'm right and that I haven't misjudged this, because otherwise these same secrets, as it were, uh, as I said, could be used very badly. I, I think of politicians who, who are there to win our hearts and minds, and they, they, they are sometimes a bit like the Pied Piper leading us down the path. But uh, mm. I, I wonder, you know, will this thing be, will people be sheeple, or will people wake up and say, you know, is, is there a control of it that it's, it's, it's uh, you, you give it by consent, or will this be a, something that, you know, because it's subliminal and it's, it's, it's out of the, the conscious domain that, that we'll have no say or, of the matter. What's your, your thoughts on that? Well, right now, these technologies are all so unknown and so new that I don't think anybody has ever tried to put them together into a practical application system before, which is what this book does. I remember when I was uh, doing some research for this back at Fort Bragg at the John Kennedy Center, and I was talking with some of the officers there in the PSYOP school, and I was going on about um, those brain radiation uh, frequencies, you know, the alpha, the beta, the beta, and the uh, theta, and the delta. And I said, you know what, why don't you guys do a test here? Why don't you sweep your classrooms and find out what... Uh, brain waves are in there right now uh, because you may find out that some classrooms are harder to teach people in than others <laughs> and after you finish sweeping them then you can neutralize them and then you can all uh, transform them into into much more productive classrooms by filling them with say beta when you want people to really pick up on a, a lecture subject or if you want them to be just more sort of pleasantly receptive to what a speaker is saying, then you can dial it to alpha. And I really scared Fort Bragg, I think, when I brought this up, because they weren't prepared for the notion that human beings could be dialed up or dialed down uh, so easily. So when I, when I suggested that they sweep their classrooms and actually consider putting some generators in them to do this, uh, the reaction was one of, of I wouldn't say it's terror, but it was of great, 
great disturbance that that uh, you could even go in a direction like this. So I don't think that most political leaders, uh, for instance, will come anywhere close to this kind of sophistication. They're just demagogues out there. Uh, there are some interesting things, of course, that some political leaders have come up with over the years. Uh, I took a look, for example, at, um, I was very interested in the phenomenon of how somebody like Adolf Hitler could control audiences as well as he did. Um, you see something like Triumph of the Will, and you've got one man there uh, talking to thousands and thousands of people in the Zeppelin field in Nuremberg, and they're all completely captivated by this fellow and semi-hysterical. So I'm thinking to myself now, how can this be? How can one person do this? And I did a lot of research into his own background and how he came to construct his speeches, which were very careful. Every gesture that he came up with was methodically practiced beforehand. The tone of his voice was practiced. This person left nothing to chance, including the time of day. He mentions in volume two of Mein Kampf that at one point he decided that he was going to have a meeting in Munich um, when he was still not yet in power. And he was going to talk to a bunch of German people about political agitation and so on. And he scheduled it for 10 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. And he got a reasonable number of people there because it was a convenient time. But after it was over, he said, this was a, and he wrote this in the book. He said, this was a disaster. He said, nobody cared. Nobody paid attention. I couldn't get anybody worked up about anything. He said it was, he later figured it out. It was in terms of people's day-night cycles. This was simply the wrong time of the day to get people excited about anything. To really get them worked up, you have to get them in the evening. Which is why the Nazis held all these rallies at nighttime when they could drive people into semi-hysteria. Because people were sort of naturally disposed at that time of the day to get worked up about things. So it's a good thing that we don't have more politicians who are that savvy. Because he was very, very calculating in all these things, much more than most people appreciate. Uh, but most politicians aren't anywhere near that. They just, you know, they make speeches any time of the day to any sorts of people anywhere, and they really do not plan these things uh, to impact them psychologically from a control standpoint, which, as I said, is probably a good idea, because I'm not a great fan of most poli most uh, political leaders, frankly. I'm glad you mentioned Hitler. Uh, he, yes, he had evil intentions. 56 million people died because of him. At the same time, though, as you said, you have to respect the fact that a five foot three in inch individual was able to command such power to create a nation to not swear allegiance to the country, but to him. And you're absolutely right as the savviness that he had to be able to control the people through the, the way that the, the method methodology of his speeches uh, to every detail. Like you said, he left nothing to chance the way he would start as so calmly and, and then raise uh, to, to raise his voice as he would get more emphatic with what he was saying and, and rally the crowds at such a level. Uh, I just think it's it, without the use of televisions that we have now, uh, the way he was able to build from such a small party being a, a loser colonel or corporal after World War One to become literally the, the Fuhrer, which means a leader of the world uh, of the the thir Third Reich, I just think was fascinating. Again, he was a immoral man for the amount of people he, he killed. He, was, he choreographed everything, and people do not realize this. They, they see him in a movie like Triumph of the Will. He comes out. He looks like he's sort of speaking just off the cuff, you know, sort of spontaneously to I, the I think of Edward of the ben, I think of Edward Bernhardt. Who yeah, was, um, everything was choreographed. He rehearsed everything beforehand. His speech mannerisms, even his hand gestures as to when he would raise up a hand and point at people or wave, all this was rehearsed. And some of the photographs that he had taken of himself during these rehearsals have survived, and you'll see them in some of his biographies, where he's actually 
practicing different gestures and then discussing this with people around him to see which ones are the most effective. So um, this is, as I said, an example of, of political demagoguery, if you will, at a very, very, very uh, refined level. I sometimes, <laughs> in, a, in a joking way, I guess, I compare him a little bit to Joel Gray as the master of ceremonies in Cabaret, who uh, throughout the entire movie, uh, between bantering with uh, Liza Minnelli and so on, is controlling his own audience by very precise gestures and facial expressions and moods and the use of music and so on. Obviously, he's not taking anybody to war. He's just entertaining an audience. But the the methodology there between a really, really good actor and what Hitler is doing is a very small um, dividing line indeed. Hitler was being an actor. You know, the, only, the closest actor... <laughs> The closest we've come to that, I guess, in the United States would be somebody like Ronald Reagan, who was, in fact, an actor. And I, I will say to you, Dr. J, and you may or may not agree with me, that one of the things that fascinated me about Ronald Reagan is that he could get up and make a speech about almost anything, and it would be like your grandfather putting his arm around your shoulder and telling you something, and no matter what you thought, before you went into the speech, you found yourself kind of nodding and saying, you know what? You're right. You're right. You're right. Because I agree. Good. <laughs> he, I absolutely agree. And, and this is why, to this day, he has gone down as one of the greatest presidents. Mm -hmm. Even though during his administration, he may not have done so much except for his Reaganomics, which put us, put us a lot in debt. But because of his savviness as a as a a speaker mm -hmm. and and a lot of people may or may not know this but he wrote his own speeches he didn't have speech makers write them uh, maybe some of them and he edited them but for the most part he wrote his own speeches for that reason he was mm -hmm. a very I, spectacular I speaker yes uh, we have uh, about 30 minutes left or maybe a little under uh, more closer to 28 and uh, we can go whichever direction you'd like to go uh, but obviously I, I did want to drive home some of the points for mind Ward. so it's totally up to you if you're if you're willing to go into that or or uh, we can continue to go in whatever you'd like I'm happy uh, to take, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to really sort of turn it over to questioning if you like and uh, respond to things that interest you or Johnny uh, there was go ahead, a quick John. question. Sorry, John. Um, it, it was going back to to the way that you know almost my mass mind manipulation in that context, and it was I was thinking of Edward Bernard, who there was a there was a documentary that I'd seen by the BBC called The Power of Nightmares, and it explained how you know uh, if, if you needed to sway masses of people uh, like women or to start smoking or to, to campaign. Um, you know, this, this gentleman was able to do that on a mass scale. Apparently, you know, as, as an individual, he was very, very poor at social skills as a one-to-one, -one, but as as controlling and getting the idea of what the masses wanted. So he was used in, in initially, it would, it would have been advertising and marketing. But then I understood he went into the social and the psyop side. Um, and I wondered if you could expand on any of that. Well, I think I know the I think I know the gentleman you uh, are referring to, and I believe this is again at about the time of World War One, and it was in the United States because what we had here at the time was a, uh, a domestic society that was very anti-war. We did not want to be involved in World War One, and indeed Woodrow Wilson was um, elected as on the grounds and re-elected on the grounds that well he's the guy who's keeping us out of war. But at the same time, you had a lot of uh, American financial interests that were all tied up in um, the British and French economies, which would have lost an enormous amount of money uh, if the Germans had, had won the war. And what you had was, uh, uh, as the war dragged on, you had a separate peace in the East, uh, between the Leninist government, once the Tsar had been overthrown, and the German army there, which permitted the Germans to take a whole lot of their army and move it over to the Western Front, which really scared the people in the West. But whoops, 
we're now facing three or four times as many Germans as we were before, and this is not good. So we need the United States. So Wilson faced the the problem really of trying to um, activate the American public into some kind of war fever that would enable him to declare war and come into it on the side of the British and the French. And this is one of the people who I believe was dealing with this because he was trying to say, well, we can kind of market this thing. You know, we can we can uh, create an atmosphere of fear, an atmosphere of um, necessity, and and just sort of keep hammering on this until people say, well, you know, we didn't want to go to war, but I guess we sort of have to. And as a result, there was, in fact, a declaration of war and, uh, in the United States, and we came into it on the Allied side. The side effect of this was that you had a very repressive atmosphere in the United States where um, this war propaganda was sort of complemented or supplemented by a number of laws, the Alien and Sedition Act and so on, that made it criminal to, to sort of critique or criticize the war effort. So on one hand, you had a lot of active war propaganda, and on the other side, you had a lot of um, penalties and restrictions against anybody who spoke out against it. And something of the same thing happened uh, later on with regard to World War II, because we had, again, a, a very active propaganda campaign here in support of the war, and a lot of pressure in the United States, well, you don't want to say anything encouraging or good, you know, about the, the Japanese or the Germans or anything like this. You know, they've got to, they're the evil incarnate of this. After World War II was over, there was a huge amount of discussion about this in the Congress and the citizenry who sort of said, well, um, we really aren't happy with this kind of propagandizing of the, of the masses by our own government to push it in certain directions. So we passed in 1947 something very interesting called, and you, your listeners can look this up, the Smith-Mund Act, that's M-U-N-D-T, which takes the entire field of PSYOP and, and makes it illegal for any government agency to use it against the United States people. And this has remained the Bible ever since. And it is something that has definitely been a restriction on on U.S. PSYOP. Uh, I'll tell you how powerful it is. Uh, when I was executive officer of a PSYOP battalion here in, in the United States some years back, we had some Army recruiters who came to us and said, we're running out of recruiting posters. Could you run off some more for us in your printing plant? And I said, you know what, guys? This is a PSYOP printing plant and you're asking me to reproduce posters that are intended to, you know, be directed for to American audiences to recruit for the Army, I can't do it. I'll go to jail if I do. <laughs> so that's how strong <laughs> Smith Mund is, and it's technically still there. But you can see that in this age of the Internet, particularly, this, these lines are getting very blurry and very hard to control and enforce because today all of our media crisscross things and it's very very hard to see where something goes and something stops that way so the old laws are being outstripped by the technology and that's another reason for mind war kind of coming in at this time because we simply can't rely upon laws to control this stuff any longer the technology is going to outrun it so we have got to get a grip on the technology and use it in a positive way and constrain it in a positive way before it winds up taking control of us. So that's you know, the other danger here and the other reason that I came out with this book at this time. I'm glad you mentioned the double-edged sword of uh, technology. I've always th figured, okay, we got Big Brother. On one hand, technology gives us an opportunity to uh, broadcast things that you won't see on CNN or Fox News, such as what we're doing right now. Alternative media is really a massive, massive uh, new uh, forum. Mm -hmm. YouTube, uh, look at all the people on it. On the other hand, feeding Big Brother uh, things through Facebook. For instance, you search something on Google, five minutes later, what's going to pop up? 
an ad for what you search to to buy you know <laughs> yes. and, and so you ha- you carry an iPhone or a smartphone in your pocket what's that doing you are literally feeding the government what sh- you're, where you're going, who your friends are. They, the, the moment, the, the time we've been on, literally, probably since the men, the men, the minute I mentioned to you this double-edged sword, the NSA has probably already cross-checked every email you've ever sent, every email I've ever sent with our friends, and everything we've ever done. And my brother used to work at a big data firm, and he basically came home one day and said, "We can build you," and I'm like, "What?" I, I I thought he was joking, <laughs> and he said literally fifty years from now a, a a child can build you, and I'm like, what are you talking about? He said I'm not talking literally. He said, but using all the big data that we're collecting, you're you're what you're thinking of. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you know this, but Amazon now. It creates sub hubs uh, locally, and what they do is based on your prior orders and your Google searches, and they predict what you're going to buy. Mm-hmm. So, for instance, my interest in Mind War and other things that I've purchased, now the local hub is stocking things that they anticipate I will purchase, which <laughs> from now, it, it's no joke. And this is literally, you know, this is not. Uh, secret knowledge. This this was on the news and it made perfect sense because all of a sudden my shipments were arriving in a day or two versus a week. I see it uh, myself the- whenever I log on to Amazon. It's, if I look at a particular book, right down at the bottom of the screen it says, by the way, based upon what we know about you, we thought you might also be interested in these. And there's a half That's a dozen right. books down there. That's right. That is absolutely right. So when my brother said they can build us in the future, what he was meant meant to say is that if 50 years from now or, or whatever given period doesn't need – he was just giving a long figure. But I, I'm sure they could do this now. Based on everything we've done, our social behavior, they can uh, essentially build a, a computer that will think like us and using all our memories from tracking us from everything we've searched, everything we've said, everything we've written – and so on and so forth. So on that level, I think technology is is not good because uh, it takes away our privacy. You mentioned the fact that we are getting to the level of mind reading well, uh, although they may not doing be doing this right now. They are using essentially a, a level of mind reading by being able to predict what we're going to do based on our previous actions. Yes, what do you think all, about that? Well, this is all still at the very, I'm very you know, much familiar with this. Over the years at various times, I've worked with the CIA, the DIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and uh, some other civilian outfits like the National Reconnaissance Office when I was a space intelligence officer. Uh, but... I haven't actually worked that much with the National Security Agency because that's pretty much in a technical area, you know, in what they call signals intelligence, and I'm not that much of a you know technocrat in that way. But I have, of course, um, some familiarity with what they do, and here in those areas you're talking, particularly when you're mentioning what you were talking about with regard to Amazon. It's very easy to mechanically track people's behaviors, which is why if you buy something in Safeway um, and you get your receipt at the register, you'll get a a bunch of little freebie coupons that all happen to be concerning things that you would probably be interested in buying based on your past habits. Same thing with Amazon. So they can track your uh, specific things that you've done they can they can sort of track your footprint but what they haven't been able to do and what so far they are not really competent to do is to actually get into your thinking processes what is going on in your mind why you make up your mind about certain things and how you how you think and draw conclusions this is the area this is the pandora's box that mind war is getting into which nobody has really gone into in this kind of detail before and One of the reasons that I not only made this book something to circulate through the government because I want them to quit, you know, shooting people and blowing stuff up, but I made it available publicly to people because I think everybody needs to get an education on this and to start becoming aware of why you think the way you do and what's going on in your head when you think that you think you're making up your mind about something. Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that's going on that's making up your mind for you. (laughs) <laughs> and you need to know what it is 
so that you become aware of it. Even something like an iPhone, you were mentioning before that the government can track you with your iPhone. Well, sure it can, but did you know that you can go to the iPhone app store and you can actually buy a number of apps that will enable you to not only detect the various kinds of brain radiation frequencies that we've been talking about, but to project them from the iPhone. Let's say that you're a student in a class and you want to screw up everybody else who's taking a test. You can take your iPhone and you can switch it on to a, an intense level of beta and you can aggravate everybody else in that room or you can switch it on to delta and send them to sleep and nobody will know what's happening. That is, is absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Can you, can you tell me again, what if, if anybody out there wants to search for, for these types of apps, what would they search in the app store? You could probably look for brain frequencies or, um, or um, alpha, beta, delta frequency generators or detection systems. And a little playing around in the app store, and you can find some of these things. And some of them are very lightweight play, play devices that you can prank other people with. But some of them are much more technical and much more serious. And, of course, there are some goofball ones that just sort of simulate this and don't do it. So you'd, you can sort of look around there and find on your own um, and try out a few, you know, if you want to. Put one of them on your phone, switch it to alpha, say hello to your wife and see if she smiles at you or holds off and talks to you. <laughs> yes, I, I, I would definitely, I think out there, everybody's going to be looking for them while we're probably listening for this interview. Uh, Dr. Aquino, we got about 15 minutes left and I, I have several more questions and obviously we'll absolutely have to have you back. Uh, but I wanted to briefly just go ask you about your work with the CIA. How long and what exactly did you do for them? Well, I mentioned that I had been through the three primary areas at the John F. Kennedy Special Warfare Center, which is PSYOP, yes. Civil Affairs, and Special Forces. The CIA, of course, has worked uh, historically with Special Forces in the military quite a bit because that's the, the arm that um, is involved with clandestine operations. But um, I was also uh, picked up at this. I mentioned earlier that I was a political military affairs officer. And that meant that I was sent through some specialized programs like being a foreign area officer, which is another training course there, in which you become a specialty uh, a specialist in a particular geographic area. In my case, it was Western Europe. And I was also, I went through at the Defense Intelligence Agency, a course as a defense attache, which is what happens when you are picked up and sent to an embassy overseas to become a military attaché, which is a polite way of saying that you're there to kind of figure out everything about that country's uh, military systems. I don't, I don't think I'd quite go to the point of saying that you're a spy, but you're definitely supposed to keep your eyes and ears open and figure out everything that <laughs> is of interest to your country that may be going on there. So in the process of these various uh, uh, exposures. I also took a number of uh, sessions and courses at uh, two places, one being the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department's Foreign Service Institute. The State Department's Foreign Service Institute, of course, handles diplomacy on an overt level, and the CIA, of course, handles what's going on in other countries at the covert level, uh, which is when you sneak around and uh, try to figure out things that they don't want you to know about. So, uh, I spent a lot of time at both the State Department's Foreign Service Institute and the CIA headquarters at Langley, uh, becoming getting up to speed in these two areas. And I've, of course, worked with a number of their personnel over the years, and both an overt and a clandestine uh, capacity to, again, figure out what other people were doing and why. There are a lot of funny stories there, I mean, such as a... Um, the person that I talked to who was a defense attaché in Morocco who was walking home one night and uh, then he was attacked by a couple of muggers. He was a commander in the Navy. He was attacked by a couple of muggers and then a couple of even beefier people came out of nowhere, beat up the muggers, picked him up and took him back to the United States Embassy uh, for medical care. It turned out that they were his KGB shadows that he knew nothing about. <laughs> <laughs> it's a spy versus spy situation. You 
Literally. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is why I brought you on. You are such a fascinating and brilliant character that has had a, a very, very, very extremely in intelligent and a very diverse background in intelligence and in military and, of course, other things. And that's why I think it's so important to have you on these airwaves as well as bring you back. Uh, now we're a, a little over 10 minutes left. And I do want to, I have more, and I know Johnny's got more as, uh, t t to ask you, which will probably carry over into the next interview sometime. And I wanted to use this time to essentially have you uh, say whatever you'd like to say to people. I, I will give you a chance to give a final statement and, of course, tell the people where that we can find the book uh, as well. But what would you like to, uh, t to spend the rest of the duration on, uh, aside from taking those questions? Well, here's the... If you know, if you want to get to sort of the bottom line of this whole thing and the whole mind war effort, people are people. You know, human beings are human beings. Um, we are dealing with everybody on an equal level of being uh, respectful, respectable people who deserve to be able to live a life. And I don't care whether you're a, uh, a Syrian or an American or a Cuban, or a, um, as, as, as we call them up in Scotland, a Saxon <laughs> down below the Hadrian's Wall. Everybody is a human being, and we should respect their dignity, we should respect them and, and uh, wish them well, and not let things like ideologies and political agendas and these really petty hatreds that are so irrational get in the way of that. And that's what really what we're trying to do. That's what I'm trying to do with this whole approach is to remove as many of these irrational hatreds and barriers to problem solving as possible. Get as much as we can people cooperating with one another and liking one another, which sounds a little bit like a Pollyanna pipe dream, but so help me, it doesn't need to be. And to the extent that we are, as I said, that so many of our mind processes are the products of this electrochemical machinery, we can certainly tune those things to be optimum instead of to, to aggravate the situation. So that's kind of what it boils down to. I, I definitely agree that we need to end this petty uh, warfare. And that reminds me of that very famous speech that Ronald Reagan gave twice, once in front of the UN, and I believe the first time he sort of rehearsed it in front of a high school. I'm not sure where the first one was, but the UN. And it essentially went along the lines of, if we were faced with an alien threat from above, wouldn't we all forget the petty little differences and come together to fight? And, and that's what we need to do. We need to stop this tribal primitive warfare because that is what's holding us back, in my opinion, from evolving into a better species. And, and that's why I thought it was so important to get this Mind War book out there to the listeners to essentially get them thinking on that level. Now, the listeners on here on Dark Matter are, are very in, into uh, this topic in, in that we need to stop uh, this violence and stop this petty violence. Uh, hatred and, and all this and I think that uh, with everybody out there listening that hopefully can jump on board and get this book and, and go to their local politicians and military generals and, and whatever they can have access to and if they don't already have the book then essentially get the idea to them because it, it is extremely important now I want to ask you do you think that uh, obviously, we, we've already covered that the governments of the world have been using, essentially, these tactics for a very long time, and, and especially certain individuals, as we mentioned, uh, Hitler and, and Ronald Reagan being two figures just, just off the top of my head that we, we covered in this. Do you think the governments of the world have already been implementing a, a, a sort of mind war already? I don't think that... Uh, I haven't seen any evidence that... Um, any of them have been implementing the programs in this book because that's much too systematic for what I see around me. I think that really, you know, in terms of all these different psychons that are in the book, um, what they're doing now is fumbling around and being 
um, accidental about any of this. We are we are definitely at a stage where this kind of thing is um, very cutting edge and and not something that most governments and people in the governments know that much about. So Mind War is supposed to break some new ground here and start talking to people about this so that so that we aren't surprised by it and we aren't blindsided by it. That's another reason why, as I said, that I have um, wanted it so much to be available to the public and not just to the governments so that people generally know what this is about. This, the, the comment that you just made uh, from Reagan reminds me very much of what I put in the very beginning of the book, uh, right smack where people, when they open up the cover, run into it. And it's a short statement by Dwight Eisenhower, who was, of course, a, in addition to being our president, he was a five-star general in the United States Army, comparable to a field marshal in the United Kingdom. And this is what he said. And it really resonates with me, and I can't, you know, forget it. Um, that's why I put it right here in the beginning of the book. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the final sense the theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending um, money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. This is not a way of life at all in a true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. Again, this is a truly fascinating quote uh, that you put in there. And and I want to throw in there about Ike, uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Of course, everyone knows that not only was he our president, five-star general, as you mentioned, he was the supreme Allied commander in World War II. He led the Normandy invasion, and essentially all our allies, uh, the U.K., um, I don't know about Stalin because he, he, although he was considered an ally, he wasn't part of the Normandy invasion, but Canada as well. We, he was the one and only person that essentially led that warfare. Now, when he left office in 1961, he made that very famous speech that essentially said, beware of the military industrial complex. Now, I thought that was ironic because we have a military president, a, a former general, yet he was the one I, that warns us of it. And people forget to realize that, okay, uh, soldiers cost money. Tanks cost money, and they drive our economy, as does each bullet. But what also brings uh, money in warfare is the fact that every piece of gum, toothpaste, toothbrushes, shoelaces, boots, uniforms, you name it, are all funded by the taxpayers and part of the war machine. And people seem to forget that. And that is one of the reasons. When I was an economics major... Back at Santa Barbara, you see UCSB for a, you know, my, like I said, we we're fellow gauchos. I, I remember my uh, my prof, one of my my macroeconomics professors saying, "What's the best way to fix an economy?" Of course, everyone had an idea, and she went on to say, "Start a war," and we were just True. totally confused. And she said, "We will fund everything to blow the the heck out of the country up, and then we will go and rebuild it." And she said, "That's is why." We, our economy thrived after the Great Depression into World War II and after because we funded the munitions going into the UK as well as what we did. And then, of course, you had every sense of, of them, every sense of the people fighting being funded. And as some, I mentioned, some of, your, from, some of your older listeners may remember a very charming Peter Sellers movie called The Mouse That Roared, which was about an impoverished country in the central power part of Europe that was looking for a way to better its economy. So um, the solution they decided was to declare war on the United States, lose it, and be reconstructed. And Peter Sellers um, 
by capturing a, a theoretical ultra bomb that was being built at the time, instead won the war against the United States, which had the Duchess of Grand Fenwick uh, wringing her hands and saying, this is terrible. You weren't supposed to win it. You were supposed to lose it. <laughs> so we could be reconstructed. <laughs> was that Dr. Strangelove? Yes. Well, this was uh, the mouse that roared, but it was uh, somewhat, you know, somewhat in the same vein as Dr. Strangelove. Uh, Dr. Aquino, we got uh, about two minutes or so left, and I wanted to uh, give, of course, me and Johnny have several more questions. We're going to have to you know, curb them till later. I wanted to give you two, two minutes, maybe two and a half minutes, to uh, essentially make a final statement to all the listeners, and go ahead and tell them where they can find your book. Well, the book's name is Mind War. That's all one word, M-I-N-D-W-A-R. Uh, by Michael A. Aquino, and it is uh, findable in both printed versions and uh, electronic Kindle versions on Amazon, and on Amazon UK, and Amazon's other worldwide outlets, and on various other retailer outlets uh, on the Internet, too, as uh, as desired. And uh, I do encourage people to take a look at it. It is, as I said, designed not just to tell government how this, how this thing can function, to reduce human misery generally, but to educate people, the ordinary people like you and me and Dr. J and Johnny here, um, to clue us in on this stuff so that we are aware of, these, of this machinery, so that we know what's happening, so that we can keep an eye on this. Because... Um, that's the way that we are going to keep our governments and our politicians somewhat under control is by at least knowing what they are doing and being aware of it at least at the same time that they are and ideally before they are. So that's why I want this book available to the public and in, in basically in every country so that we can all work on this same problem together knowing the same information. Lieutenant Colonel Dr. Michael Aquino, Ph.D., it has been an honor to speak to you. We definitely have to have you back. Everybody, I hope you enjoyed it. I- 